Hi, Pascal. Hi, Anand. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you. So today Glad my to guest is Pascal van Hentering. He's an A. Russell Chandler III Chair and Professor in the H. Milton Stewart School of Industrial and Systems Engineering at Georgia Tech. He is also the director of the NSF Artificial Intelligence Institute for Advances in Optimization. His research interests are in AI, data science, and OR. His current focus is to develop methodologies, algorithms, and systems for addressing challenging problems in mobility, energy systems, resilience, and privacy. In the past, his research focused on optimization and the design and implementation of innovative optimization systems, including the chip programming system, which is the foundation of all modern constraint programming systems and the optimization programming language, OPL. In addition, he worked on computational biology, numerical analysis, and programming languages, publishing in premier journals in these areas. Pascal is an INFORMS Fellow and also a AAAI Fellow. He has been awarded two honorary doctoral degrees from the University of Louvain and the University of Nantes. He also received many other awards, including the I-Force Distinguished Lecturer Award, the Philip J. Bray Award for Teaching Excellence in the Physical Sciences at Brown University, the ICP Award for Research Excellence in Constraint Programming, the ICS Informs Prize for Research Excellence at the Intersection of Computer Science and OR, and an NSF National Young Investigator Award. He received a Test of Time Award from the Association of Logic Programming and numerous Best Paper Awards. Pascal has given plenary talks at many prestigious international conferences, and he was program co-chair of the AAAI conference in 2019. Pascal, after this very long introduction, <laughs> I must say that I'm really honored to have you here. You were one of the giants in, in not only in our field of art, but also in, in AI. So uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Alan. Thank you for having me. OK, so let's start. Um, what is the correct pronunciation of your full name? <laughs> well, I, I, don't think, I don't think there is an agreement of this, but typically the way I pronounce it, which is very difficult for Americans, is actually Van Entenreich. Um, yeah, but you know, in the U.S., I basically, you know, uh, I pronounce his Valentin Rick because it's much easier for most people. Okay, so I hope I did not mess up that much. Uh, no, no, you were pretty good, pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> At least for American standards, maybe. <laughs> okay, so uh, your first name sounds French, and your surname sounds Flemish, so you can't get more Belgian than that. Exactly, exactly. So my father obviously is from the Flemish part, my mother is from Brussels. And so I'm a true Belgian in a sense. So Flemish father, you know, Walloon mother. Uh -huh. yeah. And, and which, which city? Uh, must be pretty rare. <laughs> <laughs> and which city in Belgium are you originally from? So I was born in Brussels. And then, uh, you know, my family moved to the south of the country, Namur. This was, you know, kind of a small medieval, you know, city in the south of Belgium, about 60 kilometers, 40 miles from Brussels. Mm -hmm. A uh, Belgian skid is very far. <laughs> <laughs> and what did your parents do for a living? So both of them are gymnastic, were gymnastic teachers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and are you an only child? No, I don't know. He's, uh, he works in the finance industry. He's a successful one of the family. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, so you grew up in the 60s and 70s uh, in Namur. Uh, how did you spend your time uh, during that period? As a kid, mostly doing sports, uh, which is not too surprising given my parents, but I play a lot of soccer. I mean, yeah, I really wanted to be really good at soccer. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. So yeah. in, <laughs> in, in which position did you play? <laughs> so I started forward. I was scoring a, a lot of... Uh, a lot of goals when I was in, um, in, the, in the youth teams, and then uh, I, you know, when I get got to the, you know, the the, the first team in my in my club, uh, I started, you know, I started forward, and then I went midfield, and then you know, at the, you know, defender at the end, as the as my speed, uh, as my speed was decreasing. It's very interesting that you are asking because my brother just texted me the other day. And he told me he saw my, you know, my coach when I was playing, and and the coach remembered me, and he he said something nice. He said that I was good at it, I had a good attitude, I was hardworking, uh, fast, and that I had really long hair, <laughs> which was true. 
Oh, okay. I think you should post uh, some of those photos that you had long hair somewhere in social media or in your web page. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so uh, do you support Underlashed? Yeah, absolutely. That's the club that I was rooting for when I was young. They were uh, they were really good at that time. It was a very different world. You know, you still could be from a small country and actually compete for some of the European Cups. So they won uh, the Cup Winner Cups uh, Cup uh, twice uh, in the 70s, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Nowadays, they're not doing as good as they did before, right? Oh, no, they are terrible right now. So, yeah, <laughs> they have a lot of issues. They, they uh, you know, they, they, you know, yeah, they, they have to sort out their finances. And it's also very difficult to keep the good players. I mean, you have people like Company and Lukaku coming from Anderlecht in recent years. But, you know, they can't keep them. You know, even when they are 17, 18, they, they are basically going to the Premier League or to, uh, or to the Spanish League. So, it's, uh, yeah, it's very difficult to keep good players in Belgium now. Mm -hmm. Just the market is too small. Mm -hmm. And talking about players, uh, did you have any favorite player back in the day? Oh, yeah, yeah. So my big, f my, you know, my favorite player was the Ransom Brink. He's like, you know, just uh, just after Cruyff, he was the, the, the next best, uh, you know, uh, Dutch player. And he was phenomenal. He has, you know, he could dribble you know, almost anybody. Uh -huh. Yeah. Was he the you guy? You remember, you know, against Argentina in 78, he actually, he almost won the game and the, the ball got into the, the, you know, the ball and yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was he not was born, but I'm aware player. of that fact. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting, it, yeah, it was an interesting team at that point. Yeah, very interesting team. Mm -hmm. uh, the first time I watched the Belgium team play was in 1994 uh, during the World Cup. A and one of the players that impressed me the most was Michel Prudhomme. Actually, I saw him play when he was like 17, one of the first games that he played. And he played against Ander like that, that, that game. So, he, yeah, he was a, he was a phenomenal goal, yeah, goalkeeper, absolutely. Ah, so you saw him when he was starting? I mean, when you went to the stadium and saw him in action? Live. Yeah, well, I was, I was, yeah, I saw him in the stadium against Ander like, yeah, it was a big game. And yeah, I saw him in the stadium. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, since you're talking about sports and you were from Belgium, um, I wonder if you ever went to Spa Francorchamps uh, to watch a Formula, Formula One race because that's uh, one of my very favorite circuits. Yeah, so this is my second favorite sport, Formula One. So when I was a kid, so we would go there uh, camping uh, before the races. I mean, not only Formula One, but the other one, the smaller ones like the, the prototypes and the, the tourism car. And so the circuit, the, the track at that point was really long, so they could not protect it. It could not be closed. And so we could go and, you know, sit in the fields and watch the cars going. It, 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 was, it was really nice. And then they actually, you know, make it more reasonable. It's, it's much shorter now, but it's still one of the, you know, the most beautiful track in the world. Uh, and so I actually saw Nicky Loda as well, Jackie Hicks, obviously. Nicky Loda, when, when he was actually in, in the in the in the small cars right so and people were saying look at that guy look at that guy one day he's going to be very good so it was very interesting he was uh, he was driving a i think a, an orange car or something like this so yeah it was amazing uh, my my uncle was uh, following this very closely and he was telling us look at this guy he's going to be really famous one day so it was very interesting wow i'm so impressed so you saw nicky lauda uh, before he he joined formula one well, I mean, I saw the car in one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw a race when he was racing in this like BMW 300 or something. Uh -huh. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then after Jackie Hicks, uh, who was a very famous uh, Belgium driver, uh, I, I remember uh, Thierry Boutsen. Maybe he won a couple of races. Yeah, Thierry, yeah, Thierry Boutsen was pretty good as well. Yeah. Not the same level as, as Hicks, but, you know, pretty good. Yeah. And yeah, we haven't had, you know, a real good uh, uh, driver for a couple of for a couple of decades now. Yeah. Yeah. You had Van Dorn. I think he was there for a while. Yeah. It's, yeah. He's not bad at all. He's not bad at all, but it's the same level. Right. So it's, it's just just, you know, at the at the door of Formula One. I mean, he was he was a driver for a couple of races. But he was uh, now he's in Formula, you know, E uh, or something like this. Mm hmm. It's good, it's good, but it's just not at the same level yes. as X and Butson. Yeah, 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 right. Uh, I mean, any, any one of these drivers is phenomenal. I mean, what they do is you know, mm -hmm. incredible, but, but yeah, they are yeah. different levels, right? So. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, were you a good student? Depends when. <laughs> <laughs> At school, I mean, uh, I was, elementary school, I, I was, you know, before, before I was uh, going to in high school. You know, I finished high school last of my class. So uh, Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was good in math. I was in French, but, you know, I was not studying very much. So, uh, yeah. Mm. I love math because we could do all kinds of exercises and so on. The, you know, the, the, the professor was feeding me with problems to solve. But the rest, you know, I was not very, you know, not interested. <laughs> but you're literally the last in class overall? Yeah, well, I'm, I mean, the, you, we had different sections, right? So I was in uh, studying Latin and mathematics. That's the specialization I was in. But uh, in that section, I was last. Yeah, completely last. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's uh, unexpected, I must say. Uh, because when you think about the, the you know, the academics and those guys that, you know, pursued a uh, uh, research career and they did PhD, they all are brainy, nerds, and very, very smart. And you are the case, of course, but uh, apparently uh, you did not want to use all of, all of your talent back in, in high school, probably. So, so did you just said that I was not smart? Was that, no. what, <laughs> that what you said? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I think I think it. Uh, I think one of the things which is happening in Belgium is that you actually, you know, you can go anywhere at the university. It's not like it's not like there is a selection process, right? It doesn't matter what you do in high school. You you can go and study various fields without actually, uh, you know, uh, having a, any kind of exams or ranking or anything like that. I think the only you know the only field where there is an entry exam is probably uh, engineering. I mean, that's what. Uh, it, it, that was the only field in my time. So you could go and study anything. You could go to the university. So what you did in high school was not really important for actually going to a good uh, university. Ah, okay. So it's it, dif completely different from, you know, many places in around the world. Mm -hmm. So when you were a teenager, which career did you want to pursue? So I wanted to be a soccer player initially, obviously. I was not good enough, but you know, <laughs> I you know, I, I, I like to say that I actually played in from more people, you know, so I played soccer in front of more people than I actually uh, gave a scientific. So uh which which uh, probably tells you more about my <laughs> scientific skill than my soccer skills. But then afterwards, you know, I wanted to be a journalist. So yeah. So that's what I wanted to be. You know, I wanted to just go around the world, write, write articles about things and so on. So that's what I wanted to do. Okay. Uh, soccer player, journalist, and then you became a professor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of interesting, right? So, yeah. Yeah. That's nice. So, yeah. And, and so the... So because, you know, you don't study journalism in Belgium, I mean, there were some good school in France, but you had to have a degree before. So... Uh, so I, I started studying economics. So, so that's my first undergraduate degree. So uh, I mean, for the first two years, my university career was uh, in economics. So it, it's interesting, interesting, right? Wow. Was that a conscious choice or someone influenced you to, to pick? Yeah, up no. So I think my mother told me, you know, OK, so if you want to if you want to do a journalism, you know, do study economics, you know, maybe you become a businessman. That's, you know, that's what she wanted me to become. So. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, yeah, that's what I did. And so did I tell you uh, the story about, you know, what happened when I registered there? No, in, uh, uh, please tell me. <laughs> no? So so in a sense, when it, you, I, I had to fill the paperwork to actually apply. Right. So and there were all these things and, and uh, you know, your name and what you want to do. And then there was a, this little line which is, was saying, do you want to take, you know, a, a computer science options like a minor or something like that so, or not? And then, you know, I said, well, you know, an option is better than not. And so I checked that box. I had no clue what I was doing. I have absolutely no clue what computer science was. And the only thing that I had is when my math, math, my math teacher in high school had explained to me something and I didn't understand anything. So that's the, you know, that decision, you know, it's, it's funny, right? So this absolutely. tiny little box, you know, that I checked had an impact on my life. So. Wow. And I mean, for the better or the worse, I don't mm -hmm. know, but, you know, it had a big impact. Yeah. And in those days, uh, I mean, you didn't have a personal computer at home, uh, so no, you didn't no. actually have no, a you, you... clue what was actually uh, uh, what you can do with a computer and, you know, program and things like that. So uh, it was actually a random choice. 
Almost, yeah, yeah. You make me feel young by saying there was not a computer <laughs> at home. Yeah, yeah, right. But this is true. I mean, the the personal computer was about to come to Europe uh, when I was actually um, uh, when I was studying university. So, yeah, hmm. that tells you how old I am. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you you mentioned you were not uh, a very good student uh, except for math and French. Uh, did your attitude change after entering the university? Uh, how did you balance between your studies and going to parties and things like that? So the first year, most of what I did was uh, playing video games. So Space uh, Invader was there. And so, we, you know, with a friend of mine, we basically spent our days playing Space Invader uh, because, you know, you know, we had no regular skin. You know, you had classes, you know, all of other times. And so it's not like you were in school from eight to five or eight to four. You know, you, you had classes at different points. Every time there was a break, we would go and play Space Invader. And we were so good that we just put, you know, 25 cents or the equivalent of 25 cents. And we could, we could play for hours and hours. We could, we could get all these free games. So uh, that's mostly, you know, what I, I did a lot of that when I was, uh, when I was there in my, my first year. I studied enough to pass, right? So, um, uh, you know, we went to parties, but in Belgium, you don't have these issues of, you know, alcohol and things like this, because we drink, as you know, in Belgium, we drink beer from a very young age. So when I was growing up, we had light beer at home. So it was not kind of a, you know, when you get to the university life, I mean, you, you don't have really a huge temptation to uh, to drink because, I mean, we do, but, you know, it's not something that you don't get drunk easily because you're already used to drink somewhat. Uh, okay, yeah. so there was no discovery of alcohol or, or anything like that uh, by the time you no, reached university. No, you don't. You don't have that. So, yeah. mm -hmm. and I mean, you can drink as much as you want at the parties, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's also the, the. I don't remember the age, but it's like at sixteen you can go to a pub and you can drink. So it's very different from the United States. Very different. Mm -hmm. So were you earning any money at that time? Well, I was earning money playing soccer, right? So it was like we were paid by the games, right? So if you win a game, you have a certain amount. If you uh, if you draw, you have half of it. And if you lose, you have nothing. That gives you some motivation to actually, you know, uh, play hard, you know. But then... <laughs> Maybe the good attitude that, you know, my coach was talking about was, hey, I need the money. <laughs> but are, were but you playing for a I mean, club or university? Fun. Say that again? Oh, no, no, we play in club. We play in club in Belgium. So the sports is not associated with university, ah. uh, with universities. So it's completely disconnected. From a very young age, you play in a club, uh, but this is not, I mean, you, you, have the, you, have the, you have the team of the schools in high school, but this is not as important as the clubs. The clubs are really where the action is. So uh, you have training and so on. When I was, when I was playing competitively with like, you know, in the, in the most competitive years, we had training three times a week. And then we play on Sunday and then on Monday I couldn't walk, right? So it's like, you know, your legs are really heavy. We didn't have, you know, ice bath at that particular point in time. Uh, yeah, so that's, yeah, I mean, yeah, we practice in the club a lot. So it, it was very funny because, you know, with the university and we had these classes, you know, these, all these, you know, you would call them nerds, right, studying. <laughs> And then I would take the bus to go to the to the, the practice, and you know, at the practice, you know, I would, you know, meet with an entire different population segment, completely different. You know, very smart people, but necess not necessarily, you know, uh, people who would go to the university. It, it was a so was a kind of an interesting contrast. You know? Yeah, and I had I had a friend. I mean, he was super smart, but he was coming from a very poor family. We were, you know, we. We essentially went in, uh, at every level. So we were playing together, and then we were in the first team together. And so, at some point, we were going to a tournament, and he was sitting next to me on the bus, and he, he said, "Hey, you know, teach me a little bit of English." And you know, I was teaching him, and he was so good. I mean, he was like a natural, right? So, but he had no opportunity to do this. So it's it's uh, it's it's kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Right, uh, but. What happened when you lost a match? Did you get paid or only when no, you... No, no, you only, well, I mean, you, you had some, normally, you know, the best players had some base salary uh -huh. and you were also reimbursed for the travel to the, to the club and so on. Uh, but if you lose, you don't, you don't get the, the bonuses for, you know, playing, uh, for, for winning, right? So, uh -huh. and, and so when you win, you had a you know, certain amount when you draw alphabet. And then there were the big games and in the big games, you know, you had some of the supporters, they would come and they say, hey, we are doubling your, you know, your, 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 um, 
I don't know how you call it, but your your reward, your your money, if you if you if you win. So I mean, there were special days when we were playing, you know, for the against the top teams, where you know you could double your money when uh, if we if we would win. Right. Wow, that's that's yeah. uh, that was a very interesting life you had uh, at that point. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you you, you <laughs> mentioned that you were playing uh, uh, Space Invader. That was uh, on arcades, right? Not uh, at home. Yes. So I mean, I, we didn't have a computer at that point. So I mean, they were coming, but the first year, the first you know, the first computer that I programmed onto was a PDP ten. So it was like a it was like a you know mainframe, super slow by you know the today's standard. But that was the 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 computer we were using when i when i started and we had like a five compilation a day so and a couple of you know 30 seconds of cpu time that's that's you know the way we were actually working so very i didn't have you know uh, uh, a punch count but you know we we had limits on the cpu times and the number of compilation that we could use very interesting right yeah that is uh 81 82 when was that 81 yeah 80, 80, 80, 80, yeah 81 81 so we had to we had to be careful and know the syntax you know you want to know exactly what you're doing you could not make mistakes so and a lot of the education for us was actually training us to write correct programs right so not to make mistakes uh, yeah it was very different very different environment right yeah and in which programming language did you use to code in those days so the first one that we were taught with was Pascal, which is kind of interesting, <laughs> even my first name. Uh, so that's what that's what uh, I used for the first two years when I when I pro well first year was Pascal, second year was assembly language, we believe it or not. So we had some assembly language class, uh, which I rediscovered like t you know twenty years after. Uh, but yeah, yeah, right. So that's what we are, yeah, mm -hmm. no, not you... twenty years, but like ten years after. Did you did you program also in different languages at the time? Yeah, so the after the so the first two years were like this economics degree with that minor in computer science, right? So and afterwards I switched to computer science, and when I switched to computer science, the first year we had a big project, which was um, kind of a, yeah everybody had to do a big software project, and the project that I had to do was kind of a, organizing the entire managing all the students, the grades, the the, the, the classes that they were taking, and so on and so forth. And so big file manipulation system, I mean, you would call that database these days, but, you know, uh, and so I basically, you know, they wanted me to do that in Pascal and I said, no way. I mean, you, you use the right tools. You have to use COBOL to do this. This is the, this was the language to do these kinds of things in, you know, uh, you know, during those days. And so I wrote, you know, uh, this, this really fake, you know, COBOL program for actually doing that. And they used it for like 20 years or something. So it was amazing. I mean, they were told. They told me that there was one bug that they never found, but the, you know, mostly they used it for twenty years and then they replaced it afterwards. So it was kind of funny because I did that. You know, this was my first slash program essentially. Wow, but come on, there are a lot of COBOL programs uh, running in uh, I know banks and in different yeah. platforms uh, still to this day. I think right. Yeah, yeah, there were good books on on cobols and how to write in cobols, you know, book by Michael Jackson and so on. Yeah. Michael so that's Jackson, what I use. not the, yeah. not, the... Not, not, not the not the Michael Jackson that we know these days, but you know, he was a, he was a very good, um, uh, I mean, very good software engineers and explaining how to write good cobol programs uh, mm -hmm. by you know looking at the data structure, how you need to structure the program along the data. It was very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're exposed to. Uh like uh, logic programming languages uh, like Lisp, uh, Prolog. Yeah, afterwards. So I think I was lucky. So I, I think I was lucky because one of the faculty member was actually teaching some early classes in AI and he was teaching, uh, it was teaching, he was teaching Prolog, which uh, I fell in love with. I mean, Prolog was very nice. We also had the, you know, in, in Liège, there was another big university. They were, they liked Lisp a lot. So we also learned that. And I did some APL as well, which is crazy, right? So you have to go and move with your keyboard, right, to do APL. So I did a edit, you know, text editor in APL. That's one of the things I coded there. Yeah, I mean, it was fun these days. I mean, you you would just learn all these languages all the time. So it was it was very interesting. Mm -hmm. But did you have books for every of them? You mentioned COBOL, the the book by Michael Jackson. But what about the other languages? Some of them were maybe even uh, rising uh, at that time. So. Uh, it would be probably so I think there were books they were, in Prolog. There was one book. I didn't know if I had that book, but we had the classes, right? So and the uh, and uh, the teacher was basically covering this. I don't remember if he actually gave us notes or something, but you know, 
the, the class was good enough such that and the syntax of prolog is like super easy right so there is nothing to remember lisp is the same there is nothing right so we were just learning on the fly like that the courses and then trying things out i, I mean at that point they were you know uh, personal computers so it was a bit different yeah so after you switched uh from economics to computer science i think you found uh the right path for the rest of your life right well, I mean, it was lucky, right? So because of this, you know, check box that, you know, this box that I checked and, and really, I mean, I, you know, I, I think, yeah, this is, this is what I like to do. It like, it's, it looked like a challenge, something that, you know, I, I, I knew would be difficult and, and, you know, that, that, that would be challenged all the time. And, and I was lucky. I had some really good uh, faculty members, you know, professor to teach me. And so, uh, and the focus was really, you know, do, do, do you know, program right. So it was like programming was important, you know, you, you need to do it right. And, and then, you know, you start coding and I love coding. And so we would spend hours and hours just coding, you know, coding chess programs, anything. Right. And so it was very funny because we had a, only a, at that point, that's when the Apple II computer was, you know, being released. And, and so we had a lab, you know, small lab, actually, you know, by, you, by, by today's standard, it would be very small. Uh, but a couple of us, you know, we really liked to code, so we would go to the lab. But you know, there was a there was a hard deadline. You you had to get out of the building by by midnight, and so uh, and so otherwise they closed the building. I mean, the building would be closed. No way you can get in or get out. And so you know, but but when you code, you don't necessarily pay attention to time, right? So and and we were like in the lab, and and some people, you know, they brought mattress just to sleep there. And I didn't like to do that too much, but you know, what we would do is we would jump out of the window. Don't tell anyone, right? So, <laughs> I mean, this is going to be annoying, but we would jump out of the window because that was the only way to get out of the building. So it, it was pretty interesting. So wow. that's how we discovered programming. Yeah, but you have yeah. to, you have to see also, they were, they were also the, the PDP 10 that I told you or PDP 11, I don't remember, mm -hmm. but we had a deck 10 as well, a big deck machine. Uh, but you know, if you code a lot and since we were students, we would get into the the level of priority where when you would type a letter, you had to wait two or three seconds to see it appear on your on your screen. So it was so slow. So you had to work at weird hours such that, you know, you were not competing with other people. Yeah. Right. So you had this very adventurous life, programming a lot, jumping uh, over the window. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, only yeah. a couple of times, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so would you like to comment on the importance of having a solid theoretical background in computer science, which is something that is often overlooked by students, especially nowadays in the era of Python and other high level programming languages? I mean, this were other, other times, right? So very different, but I think it, it helps. I think the way, you know, in a sense, you, the education that we had at that point was like bottom up, right? So you really, you know, you really learn the, the basics. We learn assembly language. We learn, you, you really understand what the machine is doing. We had, you know, class in computer architecture and networking, all these things. At the same time, we had, you know, computational complexity, which was, you know, early on uh, just still you know, being discovered, right? So, and so I think it was very interesting because I think what it gives you is an ability afterwards to actually understand see through the layers and when you develop you know languages or, or modeling language or you know uh, constraint programming languages which i did a lot it's very important that you are actually being able to live through those layers and understand and i think the the students these days i think they many of the students they start with python and they don't see necessarily you know many other language they, they don't, don't really understand what the machine is doing they, they work at a certain level of abstraction i mean that was already true when i was teaching at, at, at brown right so uh, you know, the students, you know, they, they, they started with Java. And so with Java, you don't have a really nice model of what, you know, memory is, right? So you don't have to care. But then they would take my class in computer architecture, they would discover this, and they were like, wow, 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 this is really what's going on. And so this was like, you know, interesting for them, because they could actually see through these layers afterwards. And I think this is really important. So I think for me, you know, you, you know, when I think about something that I'm doing, when I'm coding, I'm, I see through the layers automatically. And so it doesn't mean that you don't see the abstraction, you see the abstraction, but you also see through the layers and you can you know, evaluate what the impact on the machine is going to be. Right. Yeah. Uh, so you were giving a very good background uh, by your professors uh, at the time in, in Amur, right? 
Yeah, we had amazing, you know, and, a, and I have an interesting story for you. We had, we had amazing teachers. I mean, I was very lucky. You know, you had teachers that really were careful in trying to, you know, give you the, give you the, you know, teach you, uh, teach you about abstraction, teach you about all kinds of topics. I mean, we had faculty member giving you papers to read, like hundreds of papers. They, they give you a list, you know, if you need to read, read this paper. And they were all in English and we we're like, wow, they are. They actually think we can read these papers in English, these scientific papers. So, so they gave us a lot of confidence in actually looking at different topics. The other thing that was interesting is that although I was studying computer science, mostly, you know, I also had an education in OR. So I had classes in linear programming, discrete, opti you know, discrete math, uh, uh, stochastic processes, you know, uh, graph theory, and so on. And for me, that you know, that always was you know part of computer science. So. When I came to the U.S. later on, I was like, wow, you, you don't have OR here. You don't, well, I mean, it didn't know that it was OR, called OR, right? So, and so you don't have that. You, you, why is this separated? It, that, that seemed to be very artificial to me because this was all about solving problems and interesting algorithm, right? Yeah, so you, uh, you saw OR at first from uh, the computer science lens, right? They, they didn't tell us, right? So you, you had to you, you had some things that you could take if you would take the algorithm sections, which you know was one of the concentration that I took. You would get this, you know, linear programming, graph theory, and things like this. And they don't tell you this is OR, right? So they tell you, you know, this is part of your degree. Do this, take these classes, or take these stochastic processes classes. That, and so you never knew that this was not computer science. It was not presented as not being computer science. On the other end, we had courses in database, in computer architecture, you know, operating systems. We had we had kind of a very broad education, yeah. or you know, kind of modeling, information systems, and so on. It was completely very broad in a sense, yeah. very broad. Social it, implications of AI. We had a class on that, right? So, so that's what you know, it, and, and it was you know, a long time ago, right? So, yeah, you had a fantastic education, and uh yeah. you could see or uh from the computer computing perspective if you will but it made a lot of sense to you then uh yeah absolutely, absolutely. yeah very very interesting um so did you take part of any exchange program before graduating yeah so in in, in at the you know during those times i don't know what it is now so you had actually to spend a semester abroad in your last year so so what you know computer science was organized like two years of you know undergrad well the first two years well you know they have a special name in belgium and then we had three years that were essentially a bachelor degree joined with a master program as part of the last year you had to spend a semester elsewhere and so i went to uh i went to france uh, uh, you know i wanted to go to the us but that didn't happen you know uh, and so i went to france in Brittany in uh the in clad which is a telecommunication center so uh, it was interesting very interesting mm -hmm. i got to uh take the the Brittany accent after a while. So. <laughs> <laughs> and what did you do there? So I was supposed to work on software engineering. So I was part of a big project and I was a, with, you know, one of my uh, friends there. Uh, and so we did a little bit, but then the, the, you know, the person who was leading that group was also at a group in Paris and he had to spend his time between Paris and, and, and Brittany. And he was spending much more time in Paris. Um, yeah. No. <laughs> You can guess why. <laughs> uh, and so we were a little bit isolated after uh, after some time. And so um, so I think, you know, I decided to see if I could work with somebody else to actually do something because we had actually to do a master, you know, a thesis on this. So I think I, you know, I, I asked around and say, hey, you know, who is doing interesting thing in computer science? And they told me that there were two people that I should talk, about, talk to. One was doing, you know, concurrent programming. The other one was doing uh, logic programming, which I had no clue what it was. And so concurrent programming seemed to be really nice, you know, distributed algorithm, all these things. So I went to knock to his door, you know, multiple days, boom, 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 boom. And so no reply, never. And so I was kind of desperate. So I went to the logic programming person, Mehmet Dingbas. And so, and so, you know, uh, he actually it was in his office, you know, <laughs> big improvement, right? <laughs> and so, and so he gave me a lot of problems to solve. And then it, as I was solving them, he would give me other things. And so I basically got personal lecture on, on, on logic programming for like you know, a couple of months. And I did a thesis on, you know, logic programming and databases. It was, it was very interesting. I, I spent hours and hours reading. It was fascinating. I was discovering the, the entire field of research logic programming which was actually 
super trendy at that point. Obviously, I didn't know, but that was the basis of the fifth generation project, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so it was, uh, yeah, I learned so many things during those uh, couple of months there. Yeah, so you earned a master's degree uh, after finishing that project. Yeah, so there was no, there was nothing else you could do. If you had to study computer science, you had to do two years of something, and then you had these three years of computer science, and you would get a SCB and you know master degree at the mm -hmm. same time. And so that third year was basically you know a semester somewhere, and then writing your thesis and taking some more classes, and that's right. it. So the research was mostly about computer science and no R. Uh, basically. No, 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 there was no OR, no. I mean, you could actually work with somebody doing OR, right? So, and some people did, obviously, but I was more interested in, you know, building programs and things like that. So I, I was working with a person who actually doing was software engineering and AI. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. So what was your actual OR experience up to that point, other than taking the courses? I mean, almost... I mean, I mean, we, we coded, I mean, we had a, this linear programming class, which was, which was very well done. I mean, I must say it was like perfectly done. And so you would learn, you know, the simplex algorithm and all its variation and, you know, uh, you know, duality, sensitivity analysis, you know, it was like a textbook like this that the, the professor had written. Um, and so, and most of, you know, if I remember correctly, you know, we had to do this pivoting stuff and I wrote programs to actually do this because this was too boring to do by hand and I wanted to verify that I was doing the homeworks right, right? So uh -huh. it's actually easier to write the programs than to actually do all the derivation. At least you could actually check that the things were, you know, right. Obviously it was fractional, so you uh -huh. had to, I mean, yeah, there was Issues. mistakes, but you could see if you were more or less right, right? Uh -huh. So, yeah. <laughs> but was this in Cobol, Pascal? No, I think it, I think probably that it was in Pascal, yeah. That's ah, okay. What I did. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I I discovered C later on, so uh, yeah, so that was probably in Pascal. Mm -hmm. So uh, after returning from France, did you have a clear plan of what to do next, or again you you were left to you know? Uh, no, no. I wanted to do research. Uh, that, at that point, I knew that I wanted to do research on logic programming and things like this. Yeah, I wanted to do you know AI. Yeah, yeah. So it's very interesting because AI is so popular now, and I have this, you know, NSF AI institute that I'm leading. But at that point, I wanted to do AI, and AI was symbolic AI, right? So mm -hmm. logic programming, you know, knowledge representation, uh, quantitative reasoning, qualitative reasoning, things like that. So expert system were coming. So yeah, they were already there actually. So uh... so it was very and machine learning was starting. I mean, I had I had classes on machine learning. Uh, With this name. My, my my fourth year of computer science but the the name but, was uh, already machine oh yeah learning? yeah it was machine learning inductive machine learning yeah yeah you know mikalski was the one of the person who actually taught us that so it was pretty interesting yeah wow so you uh enroll yourself in a phd program no so so no no that's not how it happened so i mean i, I wanted to do a phd but uh you know the person that i met in Brittany. You know, told me, oh, you can, you know, he was moving to this research center in uh, in Germany, which was funded by Siemens, ICL, and Bull, which were the three main computer manufacturers at that point in Europe. And he was moving there. You know, he was moving from Brittany to there. And he told me, oh, you can come and you'll be a PhD student there. And so, uh, you know, and and that's that's what I wanted to do. I went to you know Paris to make sure, hey, can I go with you and so on? So because he was he was at the conference there, and this, you know, they made me an offer, and and I, you know, I decided to go. Uh, I was the first, I think I was the first PhD student at that research institute. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was, that's the way it happened, right? So after my studies, I had basically one month before moving there in, in Munich. It was in Munich in Germany. Ah, okay. So you went to, to Germany, uh, but uh, to Germany. officially you got a degree from the, the university in Namur. Correct. My PhD, yes, because you have to be affiliated with a university. So I found an advisor who was willing to actually say, yeah, yeah, this is a good enough thesis. Yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But most of the research was done in, 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 you know, at the research institute there. And the boss there was a phenomenal person. I mean, Hervé Galeri, you know, he's a friend now. Uh, and he was basically running this center in an amazing fashion, right? So it, it was... Uh, yeah, I mean, very. Everybody was working very hard, very focused. You know, he he would come in the office at seven thirty to see who was working, and he would come at, back at six p.m. just to see who is there. <laughs> if I do that with my graduate students, I see nobody. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're talking about Germany and the '80s, so 
that is uh, yeah. probably yeah it's, it was very different but but you know i think i think you know what, what was there i mean there was a, a lot of people doing amazing work in, the, in a variety of areas and and you know people were motivated to do good work um yeah Mm -hmm. And Munich is a fantastic city. I mean, it's a beautiful city. You can you drive a few hours and then you can go skiing in some of the best slopes ever. In the summer, there are some nice lakes. So it's a, it's a nice place. It was a nice place to, uh, to work. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, to do a PhD, it was, it was a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. Were you married at that time? Yeah, I had to get married because uh, when we left Belgium, you know, I had to, uh, I had to uh, marry my girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so we were the two of us, and we had we had these amazingly tiny apartments. In like, like it was like 37 square meter, including the balcony or something like that, or 37 without the balcony, 42 with the balcony, very tiny, uh, because it's you know with the salary was not very high, and uh, you know Munich was an expensive city at that point. I mean, it's still less compared to other ones. But, mm -hmm. so, yeah, so it was uh, it was uh, it was interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, and it was like we were just very young in a completely foreign, you know, country, not speaking the language. You know, it was a, it was interesting, big shock. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you learn German later on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we did. I mean, as as best as you can learn German when you're not German, right? So it's a very difficult language with declination, the verb at the end. That's that's like in Flemish and in Dutch, obviously. But uh, I think the declination makes it hard. It's easy to pronounce. You you read, you know how to pronounce it, but uh, the grammar is difficult. Uh -huh. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, and also the, you know, the language that, you know, uh, people speak in Bavaria is not the nice, you know, Hochdeutsch that you, you hear on TV. So <laughs> it was challenging. Yeah, it was challenging. Uh -huh. So how many languages do you speak? I mean, it depends what you mean speak at these days, because I mostly speak French and English uh, at this point. But, you know, I, I used to speak Flemish, obviously Dutch. And, you know, at that point I could I could speak the, uh, German, but you, I tend to forget these things. I, I have a... I have a great ability to actually uh, shut things down from my mind. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it takes some time to get back to it. So when you know, it takes a couple of weeks if you want to speak German again and so on. So I think mm -hmm. that's uh, yeah. All right. But I can understand enough or read enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and what was your PhD dissertation about? So my, the title of my thesis, and uh, actually the book that came out of my thesis, is called Constraint Satisfaction in Logic Programming. And so what we did there is amazing. I mean, this is amazing, amazing thesis, right? So it, it was the beginning of constraint programming. So, and this is really what we did, you know, what I did there is basically taking techniques that were invented in AI, you know, how you prune the search base using constraints and putting them in a framework where it become compositional and it's like you know, programming languages, right? So, and so I think that that completely changed, you know, that gives a, a that completely changed the scope of these techniques, which were used for various problems, but not in a in a kind of a, a general fashion. And we basically put them in a in a programming language, and then essentially you could start solving all kinds of interesting combinatorial problems in you know graph coloring you know scheduling sequencing you know all kinds of interesting things that were very difficult at the time for um you know mixed integer programs and so we we actually you know solve a lot of open problems in different fields by using constraint programming at that time so Who so it was very idea? interesting so uh, you have to understand that you know at that time there was logic programming was this big paradigm and alain colmero who was a, a faculty the, the inventor of product right so uh, he was actually working on, you know, what was then called, you know, he didn't call it that way, but uh, uh, constraint logic programming, where people were trying to merge logic programming and constraints on, you know, constraints from linear programming, constraints from propositional logic. But we did something very different. We said, okay, no, 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 we want to focus on combinatorial optimization problems and use this technique for reducing the search base in, you know, uh, using coming from AI. And that's what my thesis, you know, did. And so this is, you know, this is what, you know, almost every constraint programming language is these days doing. So it was a really very interesting thesis in a sense. Yeah, I was, I was really lucky to be at the right time at the right place. Was it your initiative to combine, you know, logic and constraint programming to solve combinatorial optimization problems? Or the idea came from a discussion? And do you remember how did uh, that come up? 
Oh, I, I can tell you. I can tell you the day I had this, you know, haha moment, right? So I think I think first I I was put in an environment where you had a lot of these ID there, right? So it's always the case. I mean, the the it has to be the case that the IDs are ready, right? So, and I had a lot of things that I was reading, and and so there were things that were done in a kind of ad hoc fashion, and then logic programming, Alain Romero was a kind of, you know, everything was clean, super clean, and so. So you had to reconcile various things, and and you know I was struggling with that. And so uh, when I went back the first you know the first Christmas time to Belgium to see the family, there was one article that I couldn't find you know in the library uh, in the research center. And I went, and uh, I went to the library in Namur, right? So I still had my card or something. I don't know how I got into it. And my wife was shopping, and so I went there. And I found the, you know, kind of the volume where the article that I, that I was looking for was, you know, was. And then I sat on the ground and read that paper. And in that paper, there was this footnote. Uh, it was on this technique from AI saying, you know, it would be advantageous to take these techniques and put them in a programming language. And I was like, wow, that's what I need to do. And so that that paper was by Alan Mackworth. He's a you know fantastic guy. I, you know, I got to meet him like about six months later because I told him, "Hey, we are doing this." You know, it's like in your paper. And so uh, I was, you know, that moment, you know, in that in that library, sitting on the ground, is something that I will, you know, always remember. And so many times in my career, it has been like that, right? So you you have a couple of ideas, and then you have this conversation or this paper that actually make make something click. And you connect two things that you know seem not connected, although afterwards it's completely obvious, right? So, and so that's what happened to um, to me when I was like, you know, in my first year of PhD. Of PhD. Fantastic. Uh, so you had this eureka moment, seated on the floor in a library in Belgium, yeah, and exactly. uh, the rest is history. Come on, that's. And then I told my wife, "Keep shopping, keep shopping." <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's amazing. So you were the very first person that have officially combined constraint programming and combinatorial optimization i mean you i mean it's difficult to say that i mean i mean alain, alain was combining logic programming and linear programming right so but we were doing things differently right so it was not a combination of linear programming and, and logic programming it was a combination some of these techniques in ai where you prune the search base you know what we understand as constraint programming these days so yeah, I was the first to do that. So it's a, yeah, it, 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 it was super cool because we had different groups doing different things in that space. You had also the, the people in Melbourne, you know, Jean-Louis Lassage, Reproduction Zafar, that, that were developing the theory of constraint logic programming. You had, you know, Alain doing this thing in Marseille in France, and we were doing this thing in, in, um, in Munich. So I think these three groups were like doing different things in the same space. But yeah, what is known as constraint programming now is basically, basically came from uh, that research. Did yeah. you have any yeah. idea of the relevance of the work you were you were developing at that time? I mean, we knew we were solving problems, and once again, this is also you know you have to give credit to the director of the institute, Hervé Galère, right? So he was saying, you know, we want a research institute which is not doing pure theory, right? So we want we want results that are you know applicable to the real world. And so, you know, in a sense, we were we were in this mood of problem solving, right? So and, de and developing tools for problem solving. And we could see that, you know, we were solving problems in an extremely fast way, breaking some open problems, showing them how to express them easily, you know, kind of automating the process of solving some of these combinatorial optimization problems. So if you mean my thesis as like, you know, you know, a, a one chapter on theory and like, you know, you know, you know, 100, you know, 100 pages on application, right? So that's what that's that's what the thesis was about showing mm -hmm. the relevance of this thing right so so were you the first to write a constraint programming solver to to this yeah this this solver it was a, we discovered all this all the techniques that are now at the core so so i just did uh with pierre shows and, and laurent michel we have a a, a new uh, a new mooc um uh, on on uh, on the implementation of of constraint programming and those techniques that we teach in that they are they were invented in those days right so i mean there has been some evolutions but you know roughly speaking that's what we were invite you know i was invite inventing on the fly at that particular mm -hmm. point or to actually you know have this constraint propagating what is the algorithm to actually make sure that you get us to a fixed point what are the proper data structure what is the pruning that you want to do 
So that's what we were inventing. I mean, it was amazing. I was coding all day, right? So once we had the idea, what I had the idea, basically it was coding, coding, coding. Uh, because you, you have to build this big system. I mean, it's, a, it's big and everything was, you know, it was like, you know, really, I mean, we are building a programming language with constraint, you know, with constraint programming techniques in, in that, right? So it was logic programming language and all these techniques inside. So we had to build that particular we had to build that, you know, but I had, you know, you know, one of the things that I learned when I was, you know, a student was how to write compilers, how to write interpreters, right? So I used that for actually implementing that. So, but all the data structure, and of course we didn't invent them in one step, right? So they were, they were steps where, uh, you know, we, we said, okay, there was a first implementation, then we threw everything away and I read it everything in another, in another system. And, you know, we kept developing things like this. Wow. That's so amazing to hear your, so you're basically creating an entire field in those years uh, in, in Munich. So come on, that's incredible. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, th these, these were good times. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but by the way, uh, since uh, uh, this all took place in the mid eighties, uh, were you happy no, to no. see Belgium reaching the semifinals in the 1986 World Cup? Yeah, well, yeah, well, uh, yeah, I think it was a fantastic you know, showing of Belgium that year. So, I mean, they, they I think if I remember correctly, they, they beat Italy, they beat Spain, they beat Russia, and they were in semi-final against Argentina. And Argentina was with uh, yeah. with Maradona at that point. Yeah. Right? So, and, and actually I saw the semi-final between Belgium and Argentina in the, in the home of an Argentinian friend. And yeah, I mean, he was happy, I was not, but you know, I mean, Argentina was a better, the better team but this was a this was one of the best and probably you know it was one of the best i mean benjamin had two really good teams that year and a couple of years back when we were beaten by france but yeah mm -hmm. and why did you want to go to the us after finishing your phd and and how were you able to achieve that goal so i think what happened is that you know, the, the constraint programming system was very successful and uh, the various companies decided that they wanted to commercialize it. And so there were multiple versions going there. And uh, I wanted to continue doing research and not necessarily doing it, going to some of these, um, you know, startups. And, uh, you know, I consider going in some of them, but then I said, you no, know, you know, I like research too, too much. And, and you know, in, you know, I, we, you know, I wanted to go back to Belgium, but there was no position. So, I mean, I had a, an American friend at the, inside a, a research center and he told me, well, why don't you take the list of, you know, the 20 top school in the US and apply? And so that's what I did. You know, I wrote letters to this thing. I applied. I actually looked into, you know, who was there and what people were doing. And again, I got lucky, right? So I got a job offer and, you know, I, I, that's how we, we got to the US. Right. So you, you joined the Brown University. Uh, oh, yeah. It was in Providence, correct? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, but uh, did Island. you go to the right Providence? <laughs> yeah, so this is an interesting story, right? So I, I think I was visiting uh, the University of Wisconsin at Madison, and they were telling me that, you know, Brown, uh, which was located in, you know, Providence, wanted to interview me. They, they couldn't contact me because I was traveling, you know, having some other interviews. And then, you know, I know it was in Providence, but I had absolutely no clue where Providence was located. And so I go to the travel agency. I mean, you have to understand, no internet, right? So no internet in those days. I go to the travel agency and I ask them, okay, so I want a plane ticket from Madison to Providence. And they told me, which Providence? My Providence, Rhode Island or Providence, you know, I don't know what they said, you know, Utah, or Iowa or something, Indiana. And so I had no clue. So I said, hmm. Providence, Rhode Island. And so they gave me a ticket. I mean, I had to multiple legs, right? So, but then this plane, you know, is going over the water when it gets to Rhode Island, because the way you land in, you know, in, in, you know, in Warwick, which is the airport for Providence, is that you have to go over the water and say, gosh, I made the mistake. I, I chose the wrong, you know, Providence, you know, I'm going to an island here. <laughs> But then it landed and then I get out of the airport and I, I ask the first person that I see, you know, is Brown University located close to here? And then the people look at me. Yeah, why are you asking? <laughs> well, you are in Providence, you know. <laughs> so it was very funny. So yeah, I very very I funny story. story <laughs> uh, so so how were your first teaching experiences? At Brown, it yeah? was a complete disaster. I can tell you that. So 
I had absolutely no teaching experience first. And then, you know, the difference between teaching in Belgium and the US could not be further apart, right? So Belgium is like this very, at that time, right? So I don't really know what they do these days, but at that time it was kind of rigid. The professor comes, you know, teach the lecture and then the assistants are making sure that you practice and so on. But that's, you know, it's the professor, you almost have no contact with them, right? So very little. And so they teach this in this auditorium and that's it, you know, really no, big distance and Braun was very different first it's a you know so there is a strong focus on on you know teaching undergraduate and there is very high expectation of high quality teaching and I absolutely no clue how to teach and I can tell you that I will never want to see this first evaluation that I got you know the first year teaching computer programming you know I you know it was terrible um, but then, you know, I started looking at how people were teaching. I mean, uh, you know, they, they have fantastic teachers there. I would sit in the classroom to see what they were doing. And I was like, wow, you can do this? Oh, wow, you can do all these crazy things? And so it was really motivating. I mean, yeah, I so I was lucky to see one. You know, his name is Dave Sklar, and he was teaching that class before I took it over. And I invited him to give a lecture, and then I saw him teaching. It was sort of like a revelation, right? So, wow, you know, this is how you engage with students. This is how you make things interesting. It was like, a, yeah. I mean, you you know, it's, it's always the same story. You meet somebody interesting like that, and then, you know, you say, oh, wow, I, you know, this is interesting. I can do this. You know, wow. Wow. Uh, so, again, right, you, you once were a not-so-good student, then you became this uh, computer science beast, and then uh, you started as not so good in teaching, but then you became this, again, uh, this uh, very uh, successful uh, teacher, lecturer, or professor, um, whatever you want to call it. And what motivated you to impersonate different characters in the classroom? And were you never concerned of being judged for doing that, especially by your peers? So I figured Braun, I mean, you can do almost anything, right? So as long as you make it, yeah, as long as you make sure that the students are getting, you know, value for their money and that you are making the class interesting, you, you can do pretty weird things, I can tell you. So we, we had this class. Uh, so after a few years, I took over the computer architecture class. And this is actually a class which is very nice to teach because you can convey, you know, abstractions to, to, to students, how you build computers by level of abstraction and so on. It's a nice class to teach, but it can be seemed right. And so one of the things I was trying to do is making sure that, you know, every lecture is a little bit in, interesting, right? And so after some years, you know, I, I had to teach a, a garbage collection lecture because we were teaching computer architecture and then compilers and then memory management. I was teaching the computer, you know, the, comp the, 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 the garbage collection lecture. And it, it fell on Halloween. And I was like, okay, how am I going to do that? You know, something interesting. And so basically what I did was, you know, make this guy says the great ripper. <laughs> and then, you know, the whole lecture was not, was garbage collecting people. And so I had a mask as the, the, the you know, the great ripper. I had a knife, well, a, a fake knife, right? So where you could see, you know, red blood. And so I was, you know, doing crazy thing with the students and got, you know, all kinds of jokes for the entire for the entire you know lecture and then from there on i mean i kept teaching that you know I, I was making sure at the beginning of the year that you know during halloween the you know the garbage collection would take place everything else was secondary you had to make the schedule fit such that the lecture you know on garbage collection was on halloween and so and, and then it becomes kind of an interesting lecture because you know every you know there were people all over the campus who would come just to see the, this lecture we had kind of sharks you know flying over us you know the last time we told it it was it was amazing what we were doing in that class so it was fun you know it was fun right yeah uh so you really took this to another level on coursera and at georgia tech right yeah, so, so you know, what, one of the things that we did during the pandemic uh, at, at Georgia Tech is we had to make all these lectures, you know, and, uh, and online. And I didn't want to do just, you know, recording Zoom lecture. I wanted to do something nice based on the experience that we had with Coursera. So I basically did this entire constraint programming class just, you know, with a Star Wars team. And I was Yoda and, you know, using these guys and things like this for the entire class. And everything is team with you know, Star Wars characters and Star Wars scenes and Star Wars projects and so on. And it was a lot of fun because we could actually, you know, I built, you know, I built a studio here, you know, proper lighting, editing software. And, you know, this was a, an amazing experience. 
And then, you know, when the pandemic, you know, the second year, we act I actually won and thought, you know, some lectures, you know, with this mask and I had a mask below it. And so I told a lecture like that for about 45 minutes. And afterwards, I mean, I almost fainted. I was, this was so hot and so tough. But yeah, we, we pushed it a bit. Yeah, we really pushed it. And what about the Indiana Jones experience on, on Coursera? But Coursera was, you know, Coursera, I think, you know, again, so the, it, all these things are interesting, right? So because this is not intentional, at some point, you know, uh, Coursera was starting the University of Melbourne, you know, wanted to do something. And they asked me if I was interested and I didn't really believe in these online courses. I didn't believe that I could have the same kind of classroom experience. And, and so, but, but, you know, I, was, I wanted to try. I was curious to see what we could do. And, and I had a, a good student, Skelton Coffrin, who was, you know, also interested. And so we basically, again, try to make it interesting. Think outside the box. How can you make it interesting in an online class? Can we replicate the classroom experience? And so I think we did a, we spent a lot of time. I mean, it took over my life for like six months. And we were doing the slides very carefully. We were thinking about good stories. You know, I, you know, I had all these Indiana Jones, you know, stories, all the hat that I was wearing. And it was fun. And, and you know, and in a sense, that class actually is very interesting because sometimes, you know, people, you know, I go to a conference and people recognize me and I have no idea what, who they are. Am I supposed to know who this person is? Or, you know, and sometimes they just, they just took my class. And when you teach an online classes like that, you are with them for a couple of weeks and they see you all the time. But, you know, and so they remember you, but, you know, I don't see them, right? Yeah, but the Yoda uh, thing went viral, right? Yeah, we had, a, we had about a million views or something like that in TikTok, so, yeah. But the nice thing is that nobody knew who was, you know, the person. So it's like, you know, it, it, I was anonymous and, and having a viral video at the same time. So this is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Okay, uh, you did an extensive work in terms of research and development during your brown years. Uh, could you highlight uh, those you think are the most relevant? Yeah, so sure, of, of course. Uh, so, so some of the things that, you know, I did at Brown was uh, first we starting, you know, thinking about how you make, you know, constraint programming languages as flexible and so on. And so that's was, you know, kind of the CCFD class of languages. But then I had the chance, Brown was very nice. So you had, a, you had the opportunity to do a, a junior sabbatical. And I did that at MIT and I met, you know, Dave McAllister and we were wondering, you know, what, what we could do together. And we started doing this research on uh, constraint propagation over intervals and that's the what was the beginning of the you know newton the newton project and then the numerica modeling language afterwards and it was again a really nice combination between constraint programming interval analysis and we could solve problems that you know uh people were not solving very well before so it was a super thing you know I, I i love that part of the research and if you look at the global optimization solver these days they all use the techniques that we pioneer at that time so and we had a beautiful paper in the Siam Journal of Analysis. I was so proud, you cannot imagine. Um, so that's one of the things we did. And then afterwards, you know, I was working on these modeling languages. And then I said, but, you know, we don't have a modeling language for constraint programming. Can we design one? And that's where we did, you know, OPL. And OPL was, I mean, once you start thinking about this, there are all these new issues that you have to solve. How do you express this? How do you expect search? And, and so it became a, a really interesting project. And, as you know, this is this has been a, a product of iLog and then IBM afterwards, and it it, it uh, you know and, and they simplified the language. It it was more powerful before, but um, I think it was a super fun project. Um, and then you know once you start thinking about okay, so I have a modeling language for you know global optimization. I have one for you know constraint programming. Can I do one for local search? And that was the Comet project, which was also really really interesting. And and then we generalized that you know with parallel computing, all kinds of interesting things that we did there. Uh, this was also the time where I started working on stochastic optimization. And so we did, you know, completely, you know, interesting, completely new approaches that are getting more popular again on how to solve these combina really hard combinatorial problems, where the second stage is a very complex, you know, combinatorial optimization problems and how you can solve them in stochastic, in a stochastic way. Uh, with big application in routing, for instance, and scheduling. So it was also super nice. So we had a MIT book or so on that particular topic. It was really nice. Wow, that was a very so fun time period. that I did at Brown. So it, it, I mean, I had a fun time at Brown. So very different, you know, it was small teams, but, you know, very, uh, 
you know, work def a lot of coding again, a lot of coding, a lot of uh, branching into new areas in that particular fashion. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the comment language. Uh, isn't that uh, the one that is the, the, the local server company is is based upon their, their software? Yeah, actually, uh, uh, this is one of the things that happened. I mean, uh, we had an influence on that particular local solver and, and they took it in an interesting direction where they actually raised the level even, you know, uh, even more that we were doing where they automate many things behind the scenes. So it was it was also very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and why did you move to Australia in 2010? And was this a game changer in your career? So Australia, I mean, uh, so in, in the in the around you know 2010, uh, our kids you know went to college, right? So uh, and so my wife and I were like, what are we gonna do? You know, we don't know each other anymore. And so you know we had people contacting us. We were looking for doing something crazy. And so we had the kids with us, and then we decided, okay, let's try something crazy. Let's go to Australia. And I had the opportunity to build a, a, a you know, to, to be the head of a big group, about 70 people. And I mean, this was a game changer because it's, you know, you, you, you think differently now. You think about, you know, what are the strategic direction that you have to take? You know, how do you manage a group? You know, uh, and it was really nice because I learned tons of things. They were really good people there. And I had a super boss again, you know, uh, uh, Hugh Durant White was a, he's a very famous robotist. And, he gave us a lot of autonomy to do things interestingly and, you know, define the strategic plans and execute. It was amazing. I mean, this was, I mean, being in Australia, being, having that research group is one of the best experiences of my life. It was, it was fun. It was just fun. Wow. In, in addition to your classes on Coursera, which became very famous and you, you did that uh, in Melbourne, yeah. what are the things uh, you were most proud to have accomplished there? I mean, the way this worked is that we had the time to think about what we wanted to do. So I spent a lot of time thinking about what the strategic direction should be and then refine them with the group. And we did new things in, you know, power system, completely changed that field in a sense because we were pushing, you know, pushing the, the direction, you know, pushing the field in direction that it, you know, was not doing. Mobility, you know, uh, Phil Kilby was doing some amazing things on new mobility system there. Um, we did a lot of work on disaster management, you know, uh, evacuation and so on. You know, we have some beautiful papers there. So I think we we started various kinds of interesting direction in, in a variety of in a variety of field, which have essentially have become the backbone of what I'm doing, you know, even now, like 10 years after or, you know, eight years after. Mm -hmm. I think we, we really pushed the field in different direction in very innovative fashion. And that started there. Obviously, we consolidated a lot of things. We broadened things afterwards, but it was really, I mean, this was the start of very interesting initiatives. Mm -hmm. So you are now being exposed to bigger projects, uh, having, I mean, uh, many people to, to uh, manage, to work with, but I, eventually you returned to the U.S. How did this transition happen and why did you leave Australia? Because you seem to have been doing so well there. Yeah, I think I think you know, you know the, the the point what happened there is that the the government in Australia changed, and so uh, so the, the 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 government moved from a, a you know center left to 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 much more right wing government, and they essentially cut the research uh, institute. They they removed the funding, and so we were like essentially you know either you know the, the institute was merging into a bigger institution or. Or, you know, and, and we could join that or you had to leave. And so um, I think, you know, I decided at that point that, you know, we should be returning to the United States. And that's what happened. I mean, I don't know what would have happened if the institute had continued uh -huh. uh, because we had, you know, we would have had to make some really tough choices because my kids were in the U.S. obviously. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the yeah, we had to go back. We had to I mean, we had to make a decision what to do because the institute was basically being closed. Mm -hmm. So, so to be clear, you went to the University of Michigan and not to the Michigan State University. Yeah, so this is very different. So uh, you have to really understand Michigan, right? So there are these two amazing universities and, and they are competing, you know, on all kinds of aspects. Obviously, the University of Michigan is I'm going to tell you that they are much better in everything, in football, in, you know, <laughs> in, you know, academics and so on. That's where I went in Ann Arbor itself. 
<laughs> it's a very interesting place, right? So you have a it's a it's a university town essentially, with you know probably the largest football stadium in the world. And when you go there, it's like one hundred and ten people watching a football game, a college football game. And of obviously they have a big rivalry with Michigan State, uh, an even bigger rivalry with Ohio State. So it's like it's a very interesting place. Uh, mm -hmm. We really did good work on. Uh, on a variety of area again you know in mobility in power system pushing some of the things that we started in australia we did there yeah. right so but how did you find a position there oh i applied so <laughs> there is an interesting story there <laughs> so so the so my son was working in new york at that point point in time we, we watched the, the super bowl together and i had to fly the next day to uh, michigan for having an interview <laughs> And, you know, it was a really in the you know, middle of winter. It was really close, they, you know, stormy and so on. And my plane was delayed, 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 delayed. And then at some point, you know, it started, I mean, at like midnight or something. And then uh, I arrived at about 3 a.m. at Michigan, right? So at the, at the Detroit airport. And, and, and you, believe me or believe me or not, but I lost my luggage. I mean, that that luggage was on the plane for like you know eight hours, or not on the plane for like eight, eight, you know eight hours. And so I was there, and I had nothing. And I had you know I landed at three. I had an interview at eight, giving the talk at eight. And so the people at the airport were like, you know, we're gonna give you something, and they gave me a T-shirt <laughs> and or something like that. And so I went and I gave my talk with my jeans that I had the day before and a T-shirt, a white T-shirt that they gave me. And that was my interview talk. And the chair of the, of, of, you know, the University of Michigan, IOE in Michigan, was not at the beginning of the talk. He came in and he saw me dressed like this, right? So not something that I would not have done otherwise, obviously. And he said, who is this guy, right? So, <laughs> and, you know, afterwards I had to explain to every, you know, everybody what just happened and, you know, uh, Brian Denton was, you know, nice enough to actually, you know, bring me to a a, a shopping mall so that I could actually buy some proper clothes. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, that's very funny. <laughs> and and uh, how did you extend the work you started in Australia to the U.S. context? Well, I think I think you know there are two things that happened. You know, we started thinking of mobility in a in a broader fashion, and then you know I think I you know the University of Michigan has an amazing transit system. And, you know, somehow they, they were willing to collaborate with us to actually do a pilot in parallel with this system, a mobility pilot. And and it was a, an amazing experience. You know, uh, uh, this was with uh, 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 somebody who was a postdoc, you know, at that point, Antoine uh, Legrand. We built this system for actually scheduling this entire, um, this entire, you know, uh, multimodal system in a sense. And it was really nice. I mean, this was like showing that these concepts actually work in practice. We had people, you know, really using the system and so on. That was the first time that I was seeing this kind of on-demand system for students, ride sharing and so on. And it was on the campus of the university. I was super excited. That was one of the projects that we did. We also did a pro, you know, we also built on the on the on the power system for keeping you know the good work that we were doing on power system building larger test cases and so on so that we could really actually see the various techniques uh, being applied in power system on really large scale systems so that's two areas we were also going very deep in the you know technical part you know i i you know i had the opportunity to refocus on more technical things you know less you know handling a big group and that was cool we had some you know i had some really good students there you know um, some of them are faculty in Arizona, you know, Arizona State and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it was a great time. Yeah, so it was a relatively short period, but again, uh, with a lot of uh, achievements and nice results, especially practical results. So it should have been yeah, great for absolutely. you. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, absolutely. You are now at Georgia Tech. Again, what motivated you to change jobs? And could you talk about the mobility project deployed in the city of Atlanta? Yeah, so I mean, Georgia Tech, I mean, this is the top place if you do optimization, if you do all our right. So it's a, it's an amazing place, you know, amazing faculty, amazing. I mean, it's yeah, uh, critical mass. And so, I mean, what is nice about Georgia Tech is that you bump into colleagues and you you learn so many things. There is such a large number of them and it's amazing what they do. So it's actually, a, you know, fantastic to be there. Uh, and then, you know, I wanted to actually take this pilot and actually do it in a, you know, in a big city. And, and you know, uh, you don't find a more complex city than Atlanta. It's a very complicated city with a 
the transit system is, you know, it's not that big, uh, although there is a very strong need. And so we were able to do this pilot, you know, which took over my life for a, a few months again, about a year, right? Uh, uh, you know, demonstrating this, not only university campus, you know, you know the story, right? So you design these new system and you, you show in simulation that they work and people say, oh, you have to deploy. So you deploy in the University of Michigan and say, oh, yeah, yeah, but this is a campus. And so, you know, we really wanted to do it in a big city and show that it works. And I think the pilot here, at, uh, you know, inside, you know, inside, uh, inside Atlanta was super successful. We, we could see that the people, you know, using transit uh, because of these first lags, although they were not using transit before, like 70 percent when you write. And it was it was amazing. I mean, it's uh, I think you really show that there is a need that you can address the needs of the people, you make a difference in their lives. So you should so you see the, some of the quotes that we have, like, wow, you know, this, you know, this pilot is actually changing my life in how I can actually commute to jobs and other things. So it's, it was really nice. So wow. we are very proud of, of that pilot. Uh, were you still coding uh, at that time or? Uh, no, so I didn't you... code for that one. No, no, absolutely not. Okay. No, no, I didn't code. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I, you know, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's something that I've yeah, th that I miss. I, I I'm getting back to coding more, more and more, uh, because I have more time now uh, with the institute. I mean, uh, we have a very good management team, so that frees some of my time. So I think, and that's good because this is what is needed at this point. So, mm -hmm. so uh, you mentioned the the the, the institute. Uh, could you talk about the NSF AI Institute for Advances in Optimization? In your recent research contributions involving the idea of using a proxy to replace an optimization model with the machine learning model to allow the deployment uh, of optimization in real life setting? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Institute is, is uh, an amazing opportunity. This is like a, a, a $20 million grant from NSF, you know, funding Georgia Tech, UC Berkeley, USC, Clark Atlanta University, and some, some uh, smaller sites as well. And it's really about the fusion of machine learning and optimization. So, and, and I think this is an area where there is so many things to do. And one of which is uh, these optimization proxies. And I think the way I like to think about them is that this is like the nicest possible combination of OR and, and machine learning and AI, because they actually replace, you know, an optimization component in situation where it's too slow or too costly to run. And that's a, completely unique opportunity. So we are not replacing optimization, we're just shifting, you know, where they are used, you know, they are more shifting offline, but then you learn this proxy that you can use online in settings that, you know, the optimization itself would be too slow. Or, you know, you know, this is a large scale simulation and instead of running for an hour, you want it to run in seconds, right? So that's what we are doing. I think this is one, this is gonna be one of the main contribution of the Institute, the theory and the practice of these optimization proxies. Uh -huh. It's really a fascinating topic so with many, many things to do. We did it in power system, somewhat in mobility, but there are so many opportunities in many different fields. So. Mm -hmm. And how do you handle, you know, multiple constraints using a machine learning solution? Because sometimes it can be a bit weird because you're doing some predictive algorithm and to, to handle feasibility, if you know, you know what I'm saying? It yeah, yeah good question, Anna, good question. This is, the, this is the, whole, you know, the whole point, and this is what we are working on intensively. And this is where, you know, this combination of machine learning and, and optimization is really nice, because we are basically importing, you know, concept from Lagrangian duality, Lagrangian decomposition inside, inside machine learning. And more, right, so we have these new topics in restoring feasibility and so on, which are fascinating i mean you are merging these two these two areas together by doing things like this it's it's a i mean it's a fantastic area i just gave a talk earlier today on on this topic uh in the iisc uh uh section on on energy and i just spoke like for an hour just on optimization proxies for you know power system it's it's a fascinating area what we can do is it's really interesting and they are fundamental theoretical issue and and then the applications i think are going to are going to be really, you know, enabling us to do things that we are not able to do right now. So. Excellent. Uh, so you were using machine learning uh, for certain situations, especially online decisions, but still relying on optimization uh, to yeah, solve. The I mean, you, you have to you have to get the ground truth, right? So and you have to solve the optimization problem. So no optimize, no, no optimizer has to worry about losing, you know, her or his jobs because they, they, they are still needed. Right. So 
uh, for many reasons, one of which is one, we want a solution to these optimization problems. And actually, machine learning is, is a lot of optimization these days, right? So, mm -hmm. And so I think it's a, it's a very nice merging fusion of these two topics. And I think it's a fascinating area to be in. So yeah, we are very lucky. We are very, very lucky to be able to, be, to do that work. Mm -hmm. uh, so Pascal, you seem to have the middle touch. That is everything you touch turns into gold. What is your secret? And what do you intend to do next in your career? And then if I had a secret, you know, uh, first I wouldn't tell you, but then <laughs> I, I think uh, I think I would do much m many more things because most of the time you try, you know, that's what I tell my students. You, before you get a good idea, you have tried, you know, 10 that you know, are not actually working. I think you have to be lucky. That's what I told you before. Sometimes you just get lucky. You're at the right place at the right time. You talk, you talk to the right people. I was telling one of my students the other day, most of the... Most of the good ideas are, you know, they are because you bump into someone at the coffee machine or, you know, in a hall and you talk to them and then you realize, hey, we should do this, we could do this and so on. And this is one of the things that, you know, after the pandemic, we rediscovered, right? So and with the Institute, we moved to this nice place, you know, the space behind me, like this is Coda, right? So mm. yeah, we are all at the same space. All the students are there. We are building these labs and so on. And so, you know, after the pandemic, people started getting together and you start talking and you discover again that this is how you get a lot more ideas and, and you can progress much more fast, much, much faster. I think that's what I think that's what, you know, most of the most of the good ideas were just because somebody told me something or I read the right paper at the right time. It's I'm, they are, I wish there was a trick, Anand, but there is no trick. So it's just, you know, a combination of knowing the right things and then meeting the right people and, you know, yeah, having somebody tell you something that, wow, this is cute and I should do this. Yeah, but I think you should acknowledge the fact that you're a gifted person because you can't be that lucky all the time. Come on. You, you are a brilliant guy and uh, maybe even a genius. I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's just incredible what you've done. And uh, it's it's and that's why I, I just asked you uh, what what you intend to turn into gold next. <laughs> No, I think currently, I mean, the Institute is super interesting. So we have all kinds of interesting projects, you know, applying some of these proxies, applying reinforcement learning, applying, you know, uh, a, a new new prediction methods and things like this to to energy, to supply chains, to design. Design is going to be a big thing. You know, a lot of people want to talk to me about, you know, what do we do in design, which is much more complicated in a sense that an area where you solve the same problems. I was talking to a potential partner yesterday and they were saying, yeah, yeah, but this is easy what you do. You know, you have data. What if you don't have data? Can you do the same thing? And I was like, yeah, yeah, design is very interesting. I don't know how to do that, but you know, uh, this is this is gonna, this is probably, an, you know, the next frontier. How are you gonna do design and actually, you know, observe what people do, observe, you know, kind of extract how you do design from not a lot of data and things like this. So yeah, there are a lot of there are a lot of challenges. The list of challenges is very, very long. Uh, you just have to choose the right one. So <laughs> <laughs> But what do you actually mean by design? Well I think and I just think about, you know, when you design a circuit, right? So you have to design the components, ah, but then okay. you have to do the placement and things like that. That you know you don't have a massive amount of data. Most of the data is in the head of the designer. And then think about you know everything, every every artifacts, the engineering artifacts that we do, do we do. There is a design there. And that's that's what I mean by design. Uh, okay, but uh, can you extrapolate that to the fashion industry? Yeah, good good question. But the fashion industry, <laughs> I could talk about the fashion industry for a long time. I think there is design there, but there is also finding out what people want at the right time, right? So yeah. it's not it, it's a there is a human side, which is even more complicated there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, Pascal, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I had a, a wonderful time talking to you. It was fantastic. Uh, so, I mean, I, I hope also you had a good time. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Anand. It was a good time, you know, remembering some of these stories from a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for hosting me. And, you know, yeah, I know you yeah. were super busy. That's why I'm really grateful that you found a uh, couple hours to 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 be with me today and uh, in case you want to visit brazil uh, i use i will be very happy to to host you around uh if you don't want to come for work you can come you know to enjoy the beaches 
and <laughs> and find some some nice problems to solve here. We are you know we are a developing countries, so there's there are always uh, interesting and relevant problems to be solved. So. Um, who knows, uh, we can meet in the future and you are most welcome to, to be with us. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I have to confess that, you know, uh, South America is one of the fewest places that I haven't visited. Yet, so I'd love to come at some point. Thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah. And, and in thank this you very much for hosting us. Yeah. Oh, come on. And in this case, you should not find a proxy. You should really <laughs> solve the problem. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No avatar, right? <laughs> yeah. So. Thank you again, Pascal, and I hope to yeah. meet you in person one of these days. So take yeah, care. Thank you. Thank you for and everything you do for the community. Bye ah, bye. bye. It's bye. a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Uh, so bye. bye. Ciao. Bye bye.